Are we good to go? Or yes, so we good? are Sorry. good. Oh, okay. To, we're totally good to go now. <laughs> okay. I have it recorded and um, Perfect. take it away. Okay, cool. All right. Hi, everyone. I am Mark Simons, uh, one of the co-founders here at Giant Spoon. I'm joined by Sarah. She's our senior Hi. experiential producer. Sarah. And, Hi, guys. And we've got Gab on the, on the line as well. She's our, our comms manager for, for all things Giant Spoon. Good to be here. So we'll jump into giving you guys like an overview of the agency, how we operate. We're gonna dive into one or two case studies pretty deeply. And then when that's all said and done, ask us tons of questions about how we do what we do. And then we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about what you guys are all up to. Gab, I think you're driving, right? Okay, cool. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of the story of Giant Spoon because I think it helps give you context of like how we got to where we are today as well. Um, started the agency about seven years ago. Uh, we, myself, my co-founders, we were all inside a big ad agency, uh, you know, that did big things for McDonald's and Visa and Pepsi and, and all that sort of like the big Fortune 50 company work. But we were actually part of a group there called uh, Ignition Factory inside this big company called OMD. Ignition Factory's purpose was to be this SWAT team of crazy thinkers coming up with cool new technologies that we could work with, finding things that no one had ever done before inside of media and advertising and trying to get it done. And it was about solving these like little impossible challenges where we could, we could figure out uh, things, that, things that have never been done before. We got some pretty cool stuff done. We did uh, the first uh, Shazamable TV ad we, we went to Shazam and said, hey, if we gave you the audio for a TV ad, could you put it in your system? And then we'll tell people to Shazam it. And then that audio would trigger a reaction. We put uh, a little TV screen, like a little very thin TV screen in a magazine. When you opened up the magazine, the TV screen started playing some content from CBS. So these were like just way outside the box ideas, um, not your normal sort of magazine ad and, and billboard kind of stuff that we were doing. We took that idea and said, what if we built an agency around that? That's at the core of everything that we do. This idea that we're gonna be these, you know, people that are out there trying to solve these impossible challenges with innovation at, at the core of every solution that we come up with. Uh, and that was, that was the, the start of it. It's this idea that like we were told that's impossible so many times that we almost started to believe it. And even the idea of this agency was told to us that, you know, it's impossible. You guys can't, can't build an agency like that. And here we are, and it's been, it's been uh, a wild ride. Uh, some of the little factoids about us, just to give you context of, of the size and scale of what we are today. Um, we're a fully integrated agency, so we do everything that ad agencies do. Um, we've got strategy in-house, social media, creative in-house, uh, media planning and buying. There's about 175 of us that are doing all of that work. So we've, we've scaled pretty quickly over the last couple of years to, to get to that point. Um, inside of that big circle there though, too, is, is experiential. It's like that, that became something that we became pretty well known for as well. And we'll, we'll go deeper into that. Uh, I said, we're about seven years old. Um, and we've got, you know, the, the, the makeup of an agency that can, can look forward and we can keep building on, on what we've, we've built so far. Um, so I said this before, we're a full service agency. The idea is that we combine this innovative media outlook with creative to break into culture. And that's the idea. We need to be able to break into culture with whatever we do, whether it's making a TV spot or we're coming up with an original podcast idea or we're creating a crazy experience. These are things that result in us actually like breaking into what's happening in the world and people paying attention to the thing that we make. Because whatever we make then, and it's on behalf of a brand, they pay attention to the brand as well and what we're trying to do. But what we're trying to do at the end of the day is sell more of whatever the brand wants us to sell. So we need them to pay, we need people to pay attention to it. Next slide. Uh, this is a bit about like the model of how we've built it. This is pretty different than I think most agencies and how they're set up. Um, we believe good ideas can come from anyone. I think most agencies think good ideas can come from the creative team and it's sort of relegated to the creative team to come up with those ideas. I'm not shit talking any, any creative agencies that are out there, some really good ones out there, but I think we've made it a point for us that we really think that these ideas are things that come from all of us working together, all of us being integrated into you know, the work that we're doing and the work that each other are doing 
so that we can come up with ideas that actually truly make an impact. And it's not just going to be some sort of 30 second TV spot that wins an award, but really doesn't make any impact on that client's business. We're trying to come up with good ideas that really do uh, make a difference in, in a client's business. Next slide. This is the long list. I don't know if everyone can see it either, but like it's everything that we do. Um, there's a lot of different services with, with 175 people, we can do all of these things. Um, but it's everything from the start of it with strategy and all of the services underneath strategy, what that really means for clients, a creative department who is coming up with crazy cool ideas and they are copywriting and art directing and graphic designing and doing all of that work. Uh, media, which includes planning and buying and spending the client's money uh, to get them into the right places to reach the right audiences. Experiential, which is a whole sort of sub agency within the agency that is fully functioning and can do all of the, the full serviceness of what experiential agencies can do. And then we wrap it all around with, with uh, data analytics. We have to measure everything that we actually do so that we can prove to the clients that it worked so that they give us more money to do more things for them. Uh, what else we got? A sample client list, uh, just to give you an overview of, and this is really a sample. I think the, the list is probably double or triple the size, but this gives you a taste. We're doing everything from a lot of entertainment work. Uh, I'm in Los Angeles. We've got a New York office as well. So a lot of entertainment clients, technology clients. Um, we are, we're a little bit of, of everything. Uh, I don't know that we've done a whole lot of automotive work, but you know, there's a few categories where we haven't done some things, but most everything else we've, we've covered. And we got some awards for some of those things that we've done, which is always nice, especially after doing this for seven years with, with this agency. Like we've got a pretty cool trophy case um, where the recognition is for the actual work that we've put out into the world and the effectiveness of that too. So I think the trades, they see us, you know, the, the ad ages and ad weeks of the world see us as this innovative agency. They write about us like that. It's because of the work that we do and the people that we have. So we're, we're proud to, to rack up a few awards over the couple of years. And uh, I wanted to jump into experiences, but maybe pause there for an awkward silence. If anyone wants to ask a question uh, about the agency, just like the generalness of the agency and everything that we do. Otherwise we can just jump right into experiential and I can explain all that. Cool, okay. Experiential. I'm sure there'll be questions at the That's, end. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, so experiential. Uh, we actually only started doing experiential a couple of years ago. We, we had been doing sort of this strategy and ideas service for a while. Uh, and as it started to develop and clients asked us if we could actually execute and do the ideas that we were coming up with, we started to build out different practice areas. And experiential was, was one of those executional practice areas. So how do we think about experiences? Why is what we do different than what other experiential agencies uh, look at? I think the answer's on the next slide that we don't look at it like it's event marketing. Experiences immerse people in a world. I think the key word here is it's, ex it's an experience. It is not just like an event you attend and some, you know, you, you pop by the brand's tent, you pick up your free t-shirt and you move on to the next thing. This is, if you're really looking for a brand to make an impact on a person and have some sort of connection, they have to experience that brand. The, the brand has to come to life in some sort of way. So we really look at it like, no, if, if you're, uh, you know, an insurance company, you can still build something that immerses people into the brand of that insurance company. We, it's a challenge to figure out what it is that you, people can experience in an insurance company. It's a lot easier to do it for some of the entertainment clients that we have, but there's still something there. And that's the, that's the important piece of this is that we have to go further than just thinking about the swag that people can walk away with. Uh, and we believe brands build meaning through stories and the most compelling story is one that you can like really actually live in and you can experience it with all of your senses. You can, you can step into that world and you can walk away from it and you have learned something about, about that brand. So uh, we look at experiential as something that drives engagement in real life. It's grounded in innovation. We integrate it with PR so we can make noise about it. Uh, and then we look at every other touch point that might be around this experience, digital, social content, all the other things that might come out of it so that that experience doesn't just live in that footprint that we might occupy, but it extends beyond that. And that's really where, where we see uh, the most impact with, with, uh, with and for clients. 
And this will give you a little bit. Hold on. Okay, how we make it happen. We are, uh, this is a bit of like our approach. Uh, we start strategy with, with everything that we do. Um, we look at what is the thing that's gonna make this click with the people that we're trying to reach. What is it about this brand or this experience that we're trying to, to connect for people? Uh, and that's it. everything we do has to start there. We don't just jump right into coming up with ideas. Then when we start to actually build the experience, we think about all of the different little details, everything that might bring that thing to life. It is, you know, the smell of that space that you're walking into. It matters. It's, you got to make sure that every little piece of trash is picked up and that, you know, there, there's, there's no scuff marks on the floor. Like that stuff is the stuff that people really do notice. So we walk through our experiences beforehand and we look at for whatever detail we might have missed. And, and at the last minute, we might add something like, like a scent to an experience. Uh, and then we make sure that, again, like we're looking at how that, that experience can be shared and amplified. And just making sure that like it is, it is built so that people can take pictures of it, that then they can share it, that then they can tag it so that they can tell the world about it. Those are really important to us because we might get 4,000 people to go through our experience, not a small number, but a brand needs to reach you know, millions of people in order to really make an impact. So that 4,000 people, we have to look at the, the easiest path for them to make sure that that experience is gonna be shared out to as many people as possible. And that, that person's gonna be excited to share that, that thing out to as many people as possible as well. This gives you a little bit more of like, really what's going on behind the scenes of like how we're actually building this stuff. Um, the process can be pretty lengthy, depending on, on how big of an experience it can be. And, and we'll talk about Westworld and Lovecraft, two HBO projects that we did. They did at least these timelines. Um, they can be you know, six months, eight months for us to really build out something truly special like that. So it starts with concepting. Uh, it's it's you know, starting with strategy. Then we come up with some, some ideas. We're going back and forth with clients. We're giving them ballpark budgets so that they understand what things might cost, which ideas might be the right ones. It's a lot of back and forth. It takes, it takes quite a bit of time to start to like triangulate what it is that we're actually gonna start to, to really bring to life. Next step is uh, design. We like to 3D model everything that we do as much as we can so that clients can, if they're walking through the experience and they know this thing is gonna be real one day, let them virtually walk through it. Let them like, we'll do a fly through of the 3D model that we build so that they can really see like, okay, this is gonna be over there. That's gonna be over there. Where's this? We'll let them, we'll try to answer as many questions as possible while we're doing it in a 3D model. So that when we go to fabrication and start building this thing, there's less questions to answer and there's less changes that need to be made as well. Um, so good amount of time is spent really going, going deep on, on the design aspect of it as well. Uh, and then there's production, there's, there's the build. It's, you know, we, we don't do everything in-house. We've got fabricators that we engage, uh, technology companies that we engage, figuring out what's needed for every project is, is a big part of it. But we'll go into the production phase, which is uh, where Sarah really will, will dig in deeper as well to start to really build the thing. It's where, where hammers and nails start, start pounding and, and things are built. Um, we, we, you know, budgets are sort of tweaked along the way because things might still come up, but this is, this is where the thing actually really starts to come to life. And it's in the, in the couple weeks um, sometimes before we're actually live with something. Uh, and then there's uh, a good amount of like post-event, post-experiential work that's done where we, we do the wrap up and we, we do the final reconciliation of the budgets, all of those little things. There's, there's a good amount of time that's spent afterwards to make sure that, people, that the client understands the impact that we really made and understands that like this, this was a success for all of these reasons. So, I think you guys probably have heard of, of this Westworld activation that we've did. If not, let's, we can play this video. I think it'll work through Zoom just to give you guys a sense of, uh, sense of this experience. And this was a couple years ago. No, the audio is not playing. Far more elaborate and similar to the Good. show than anything we have ever seen.
the, the music's not playing for some reason. Welcome to Westworld. With season two fast approaching, we had to reignite the show's fan base. Westworld is a luxury destination where guests can go to live out their wildest fantasies. So we gave thousands of fans the opportunity to do just that in real life. We built Westworld. 90,000 square feet, 444 pages of script, 66 actors, an infinite number of user journeys, 1.9 billion impressions, and the number one most talked about event at South by Southwest. Guests were shuttled into the secret location 30 minutes outside Austin. If they broke the code, they came in on luxury lifts, and some took a real Delta flight to Westworld. I tell you, something's going on, man. Yeah. At some point, I was having an interaction with one of the hosts, right, and I kind of forgot that it was an actor. Guests were rewarded with an immersive experience that considered every detail. A unique mission was given to each person that brought them deeper into the narrative, and there were dozens of Easter eggs hinting at season two. Even the press photos unlocked clues. An experiential event became a film set for content, bringing a global audience into the park. A simple idea, Build Westworld, created an emotional and authentic experience fans would never forget. Well, I know it's hard to hear the, the talk track. I will send the link so you guys can, can see it all as well. But uh, we built Westworld. We, it, was a, it was a real live working Westworld for uh, about four days. Uh, it was special like there was just something really really cool about that and i think it set the bar for what what we mean by when we say like immersive experiences where you're stepping into a world that was literally that we uh and i think we've had a lot of other uh very good immersive experiences come to life after that but this one sort of set the bar for sure uh so i think with that we'll talk one more and we'll go we'll go deeper on this one too so you can get a sense of like what it really took to build it uh, so I think, Sarah, you will take it from here and talk about Lovecraft. You there? Yeah, do you want to start with the video or do you want me to, I mean, I can kick right. it off. So um, Lovecraft Country, this is a project that we worked on for a long time. Um, we faced a lot of challenges as this was de started developing pre-COVID um, and came to life after. So we faced a lot of unique challenges. Um, especially regarding keeping this in world as you know, the immersive aspect, I think we can watch the video and then we can talk a little bit about um, sure. everything that happened and how we did it. The road to left lab country was paved with danger, especially in 2020. Earlier that year, we planned a series of in-person experiences to promote Misha Green's landmark new show set in the 50s. But when the pandemic hit, everyone had to take a detour. Instead, we invited fans to several touchless COVID-safe drive-ins, the last of which had them wondering if they would ever drive out. The girl and I 500 guests into the Lovecraft Country drive-in, where in-world actors made them feel a little too at home. Seven billboards for Lovecraft Country businesses set the stage, and 160 minutes of custom radio content set the mood. Guests visited an eerily empty concession stand to score limited edition treats from Black-owned businesses, which supported the themes and spirit of Lovecraft Country. While parking, they saw some liminals in the coming attractions. Throughout the whole experience, COVID safety was top of mind for guests and the staff. The contactless drive-in used 110,000 milliliters of hand sanitizer, innovated all new ways to keep guests in their cars, and offered tips at every turn. When the show was over, we made sure we left everyone with party gifts, offering a protection spell to keep them safe as they made their escape. Misha, they got what they need. And surprising guests at home with a memento from their journey. The response spoke for itself. Even the cast got in on the action. In the end, there were twists and turns, but our attendees found their way out in one piece. The Lovecraft Safety Commission reminds you, if you see something, no need to say anything. It's all in your head anyway. 
So I think just in general, um, this experience really lines up with Mark was saying as far as, you know, what is experiential. I think that, um, you know, parties are cool, screenings exist, you know, you can go somewhere and watch something. But what we try to do is say, okay, you're not just coming to a screening, we're taking you to Lovecraft Country. Um, and so that means, you know, also in line with, you know, what Mark was saying about ideas come from everywhere. Yes, we have, you know, brilliant strategists and creatives who think of the whole idea. But when it comes down to, you know, actually, how is it going to play out? Um, you know, we think about what happens everywhere. So when we're looking at a floor plan, it could be anyone who says, why is this going here? And our job is to think of a reason. If there's not a reason why it's there, then maybe it should be somewhere else. Um, and I think, you know, why are we using this color instead of that color or, or literally what, you know, how, where are things physically being placed? All of those things um, have thought behind them. Nothing is arbitrary. Uh, if we, you know, for the example with this event, like if we, of course we need garbage cans, but we didn't want people to get out of their cars um, because of COVID. So we, we use like drive through McDonald's uh, garbage cans that are like car heights. You could drive through and deposit your garbage. So from down to the smallest thing to the biggest, you know, 40 foot wide marquee, um, you know, it's not just dropping a cool piece of scenery, that's part of it, but it's also planning and providing a rationale and really challenging our internal teams to think, why are we doing this? Why are we making this choice? Um, and giving ourselves the opportunity to punch up an experience, even in just the smallest ways. Um, just overall, you know, I mean, I think there's things that people notice when they attend an experience. Um, there's things that they notice implicitly and there's things that they notice explicitly. So a giant scuff on the floor, yes, that's something they'll notice explicitly. They'll notice a big flashy marquee. They'll notice giant set pieces, but there's also implicit things that they might not leave and say, oh yes, this one thing happened. It's subtle, but we put it there because it creates a feeling, um, it creates an atmosphere. Uh, and and just overall contributes to your experience. Um, do you wanna, I don't know what slides we have about this actually. Uh, so what we did for this was um, we wanted to create a completely contactless experience. Uh, this happened in uh, the beginning of October. It was supposed to happen in July, uh, but July was a terrible month for COVID. Everything was crazy. It was supposed to be the premiere. So we, pivoted to doing a finale celebration and screen the finale episode. Uh, but the challenge with doing a contactless drive through or drive in experience um, is that this was supposed to be set in the 1950s. So a lot of um, ways around making things contactless now are very tech focused. You are checking in on an iPad, you're scanning QR codes, you know, you're using technology to not have to physically like hand over someone a ticket who rips it in half, like, you know, the old days. Uh, but we didn't want to take people into the modern world. We wanted to leave them in the 1950s. So we created barriers where all this, we used all that technology, but it was all behind the scenes. When you pulled up, uh, you spoke to a check-in person over an intercom instead of, you know, normally you would go and, you know, check in with a brand ambassador at a booth uh, or, a, or a counter. Um, we had remote trailers where all of our performers who are actors communicating over the intercoms were sequestered safely um, and they were interacting. They had our registration list from our online registration, just like they normally would, but the guests didn't see any of it. It was like they were ordering at the drive through just speaking to someone, but they, we wrote lines for them. We had responses. We also had hidden um, cameras that showed guests in their cars so that they could say, oh, that's a lovely hat you're wearing, but they didn't, you know, you wouldn't know that the person could even see you. So every kind of stage where we would have those interactions, uh, we built in a layer of contactlessness. Even uh, we had their photos taken as they were driving through. We had a secret walkie talkie between the check-in person and the photo booth company so that they could say, hi, you know, Louisa is pulling up now and they would type in her email address from the back end and you would get your photo emailed to you, not even knowing that anyone collected your information because it was attached to when you checked in. So 
you had a photo taken, you had this cool in-world photographer jump out, but you weren't typing in your email address on an iPad, which was, you know, not something that would happen in the 50s world. Um, so we thought of, I mean, even like the parking gates, we were like, how are we going to control that people, you know, pull up to the intercom, check in, and they don't just drive in if they're not registered to the event. So we used like parking garage lift gates that we sent to our fabricator that they beat up and masked and made look in world. Uh, and the check-in person who was hidden in this trailer had a button that when the person was accepted, it lifted the gate and they drove in. Um, we, that doesn't exist in a rental fashion for events. We had to call 20 different parking lift gate companies because uh, they are used to permanently installing them in cement in parking garages or parking lots. And they're like, well, you know, you can't just use these temporarily. These are permanent structures. And so we called around until we found someone who was willing to work with us and actually very excited because they're like, my job is boring. I just do these parking gates all day. Uh, this is really fun. I get to think of like solutions to make this portable um, and make it temporary. So, you know, it's sort of looking around at the world and things that you know exist or challenging your vendors and suppliers to work with you to say, there's got to be a way to do this. Let's put our heads together and figure out what it is. So, and Sarah, just to add one point too, I think we use the contactless environment to our advantage because it spoke to the like creepy supernatural nature of the show where everything meant to look abandoned and a little scary. So I think that we did that in a very smart way, having everything feel touchless, contactless, very standoffish. And I think um, the radio is also a very good point to that if you wanna maybe yeah. let the team know about that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so everything was part of, of the experience. Like I was saying earlier, like everything has a reason. So is it, it's contactless, but also how does it support the story that we're trying to tell and the world that we're trying to put you in? Um, so when you pulled in, uh, you know, we even put on the, on the invites, like a fake address that wasn't like exactly the gate. Cause we wanted them to take a specific route. We like Google mapped from anywhere in the area where you were coming from. Cause we wanted to make sure everyone turned down this one street, um, which is where they would start, which we had property on that street. So we could put billboards and like this radio station sign and some of our other graphics down the road before you even pulled into the drive and you were in the world, you turn on your radio station and we made a fully custom radio station with music, with um, advertisements for some of these show-based and in-world um, companies. We also created like a fake organization called the Lovecraft Country Safety Commission, which helped us have in-world messaging uh, about just general COVID safety, like wear a mask, don't get out of your car. Um, and, he, and our DJ then was able to have PSAs that he did in, you know, his cool voice saying like, you know, the Lovecraft Country, Country Safety Commission reminds you to blah, blah, blah. We could also use it for um, instructionals that we scripted to sound cool and inside the radio station. But we could say like, make sure you follow the red arrows, you know, make sure you're, you know, picking up your lunchbox, but they scripted it creatively in a way that just made it fit seamlessly into the radio station mixed in with like fun little nods, music. Um, so it didn't feel jarring. We also then used that as our opportunity to uh, have like a voice of God communication if we need it, if there was something happening. I mean, at one point, like five people couldn't figure out how to turn off their headlights. So we were able to have a guy uh, just cut into the radio and make like a cool in-world comment live as we realized we needed it to solve that problem of not having to have staff walk around and knock on everyone's window face to face when you're we trying to avoid that contact and, and communicate with people in that way. So any barrier that we could create to having to pop your head in people's windows, we used every tool that we had, which we wanted to have anyway, because it helped create the experience. So win-win all the way around. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty good. I mean, obviously then, you know, they saw the screening, we, uh, we had, um, really cool self-contained lunch boxes that had their snacks and drinks um, that we created fake in-world brands for like Coca cola 
um, provided bottle opener for the bottles. Um, we put their parking space number on there. Um, we had custom artwork made for bandanas, uh, trading cards of characters from the show, cookies. So the lunch boxes were a great tool to, you know, provide contactless snacks. Working at our favor was that the episode was one hour long. So we didn't, we weren't showing them three hours of content with just popcorn. Um, but we were able to remove like that concessions element and create this very cool moment where you pull up to this booth, it looks abandoned and before your eyes, uh, mysteriously, your lunchbox turns around. We built like a, a sneeze guard, Lazy Susan in there so it would be protected, but it worked to make it just like this eerie, where did that come from kind of moment. Um, but, you know, if you know anything about Lovecraft Country, the show, um, you know, representation and diversity are really crucial in how they even like hired their crew, how they cast the show, everyone who was involved, that was really important. So we decided our event should follow the same rules, you know? So over 50% of our production costs were by BIPOC owned businesses, including a lot of the items in the lunch box, um, including our fabrication, any opportunity that we could, uh, we made that a, a huge priority for us. So, you know, it's tough. You have all these, um, you know, just people in your Rolodex that you work with all the time. But I think, you know, forcing yourself to just slow down a little bit, go outside of, you know, you're just easy, check it off the list and make sure you're incorporating and, you know, really investing dollars into great businesses that you just didn't happen to know about before that can provide you with these services and items um, was, a, was a really great experience and really contributed to making the event better. Um, we used the giant 75 foot wide screens as, um, as other billboards as well. We knew that people were gonna be pulling in and there was gonna be some downtime between when the first car arrived and when the last car arrived. Uh, so why have that screen be blank? Let's use it. It's huge real estate. Um, we, you, we put some of our ads up. We put instructionals up. Um, we advertised our Coca-Cola so that you would see an advert, a giant billboard for it and then look in your hand and it's the same brand. Um, and we also, in order to re reduce contact, created a text assistance line uh, so that you had questions um, you could say, you know, how do I get to my spot? Or what time does this thing start? Or whatever questions people might ask. We didn't want them getting out of their car and walking around and looking for staff like they normally would. And we actually had a service where one of our copywriters could be logged in behind the scenes, answering people's questions in an in-world fashion, um, staying in line with sort of the tone of the DJ and other elements, uh, just to really make it all feel part of a piece. Yeah, we had uh, about 250 cars come through. Uh, we had a big exit moment uh, that when you drove, when you were driving out, we knew that that was going to be a bottleneck. Um, that's when all of the lanes of cars sort of converge into one lane getting out. So like, what are people going to do while they're slow there? We don't want them just to be like, well, guess this is over, you know, and just take them completely out of world. We want to stay with them as long as we could. So the radio station came back on the tone and some of the dialogue from the DJ that was all shifted a little bit um, to be part of the conclusion moment and referenced, you know, something's going on out there. And then you turn out, you see this like cool moment that was just based off of a scene that they had just seen in the finale. So we really took it home. And about a week and a half later, uh, guests mysteriously received their photo moment pictures in the mail. Um, in this very cool package, uh, just to remind them about the time they had. And again, they never uh, gave the photographers their information and somehow they just knew who they were and where to send their stuff. So it was all pulled from uh, their initial registration. And uh, yeah, we did a lot of, uh, a lot of COVID related work. Um, we, I became a COVID compliance officer just so I could like learn everything. Um, although it's not ethical to COVID compliance your own production. Uh, but I knew 
what our COVID compliance officer would be looking for. Uh, but yeah, tons of hand washing stations, really a big additional cost, but HBO was really, really committed to only doing this safely and only doing this properly, as were we, not having anyone leave with a question in their mind, crew, staff, or guests about whether or not they were safe or, you know, that was taken into consideration. So everyone got a custom hand sanitizer in their lunchbox. We had stations everywhere. Um we did on-site testing for crew and uh, we did zones, which you know adds a lot of time and complication to a load-in, which is normally just a scramble, all hands on deck, everyone run here, everyone run there. We built uh, our pieces, our set pieces in as complete as they could. Our giant concession kiosk came on site whole, normally, um, which is more, you know, a couple more trucks, a couple more, you know, forklifts, but that prevented us from having to bring everything in pieces and have a bunch of guys on crew face to face hammering and nailing things together like they normally do um, to remove those sort of close contact moments. We, we took steps that, that led back months uh, before we came on site. That's it. Uh, we created a lot of content. We drew a lot of eyes. Uh, we got a lot of attention on social. We got a lot of attention in the industry. Um, and it was, we had a lot of cool people attend and express their excitement about it. So it was, it was a huge success. Um, it was a frantic challenge like it always is. Um, but you know, we just always aim to plan for as much as we can in advance so that we have bandwidth as it's happening to deal with the things that inevitably pop up. Fire away, there's gotta be some. I have a question actually, cause personally I've been to a, a driving experience, but it's for Halloween. So it's like this, but it's like you're driving there and then uh, it's in the middle of nowhere and they have like giant scream and they were playing some clips from like horror movie, but then there will be like some staff, they were coming out and kind of scare you. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, I think we talk about, you guys talk about like the process, how they come into the space and how they leave it. But like, uh, what's like doing the middle? Like, are they watching some kind of movie or like, is there like people coming out? Because the experience I had is kind of like, I mean, it's not that exciting, but I just like curious, like, uh, what did you guys do for the last, um, for this one? Uh, well, the primary purpose of this was a screening so that people would pull in at the drive-in and, and watch the finale episode. So, you know, we could have just said, okay, be here at 8 p.m. And they pull in just like going to the drive-in movie and watch a screening, um, but you know, that's not the kind of experience Giant Spoon would create. We aim, you know, we say what's happening from the minute they, they hear about this until as long as we can have their attention. In this case, we got them, you know, 10 days after they left. So really this was just all built around sitting in your car, watching a screening. The reason we even thought of the radio station and creating that content was because when you go to a drive-in movie, um, the sound from the movie plays over your car speakers via FM radio. So we're like, we already have to have them at some point tune into the radio. Let's harness that. How can we use that? We know they're going to have to tune in anyway. Let's control what they're listening to and make a part of the experience as well. So even the, you know, the first guest who pulled in, you know, if they got there 40 minutes before those episodes started, they were listening to radio content. They were seeing rotating artwork on the screen. Um, they were pulling in and driving through, getting their lunchbox they were definitely all posting to social so the, I would say that's like the the bulk of the middle yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense I just want to play that music to see if you can hear it this is what we had to fill time it was 160 minutes of custom content so I just want to give you a taste Boom, be -do, be -do, be -do. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
She's a three girl and I love her man. So you you get the idea, I think. So, you know, when you're driving from zone to zone, picking up your lunchbox, driving to your parking spot, it's not just silent. You're still in that 1950s kind of experience. Um, and this was just a short snippet. There were like radio advertisements, music, et cetera. So Sarah and team thought of everything. I have a question while we, we see about other students about the details. You guys have thought of every detail. And mm -hmm. I, I think this is something uh, I try sharing with students, if they're going to share a guest experience, I want to know every detail, do not leave me hanging on anything, right? And and I think y'all have really proven that. I'm curious about the teams. So you had said, Mark, at the opening that you have all these different teams and that the ideas can come from anyone. Can you talk a little bit about um, the process within Giant Spoon of like who's involved, when, where, and yep. how much you hire out versus yep. keep inside? Yeah, for sure. So it's, uh, there's always an account lead, someone who's in charge of that relationship with that client. And it is a bit of like, a, they're making sure the thing is moving on that process. So that we're, we're going through it, we're doing it on time, we're getting every deliverable, we're getting the feedback from the client. So all the way through, there's an account, there's an account person that's attached to it. Um, strategists and creative sort of pod together where the strategist is doing the digging and figuring out what are the insights, where, where is our opportunity inside of this? And they're working hand in hand with creatives. They might be copywriter, art director, creative director, sort of a pot of people who can sit together now virtually, but physically they could sit together in a room and they could, they could brainstorm and they can get ideas on, on paper and start to come up with something. They would all be working together to come up with that. We'd also make sure that producers are involved in that process as well to gut check. And, and add to it because maybe they've seen something that could be applied to this idea or that idea. Um, so between all of that, there's a creative team, some strategy people, there's an account lead. Production might be the one where like, we're gonna scale up as needed, depending on the size of the, the, size of the experience and how many people we need on the ground to, to, to move things around or how many things are coming together. And we just have a lot of different work streams happening. So we might have multiple producers on a, on a production to bring something to life. So we'll usually, we'll, we'll freelance out to that community to, to get extra hands on, on site. And then there's the on site, which is a whole other thing. We might actually scale up another 50, 60 people just for one production. And it will, it will be done through vendors, through, we have companies that handle brand ambassadors who can walk around and hand out the different items, uh, security teams, if we need that to, to surround the perimeter of something. So it, it can be, any production could be a couple of people all the way to like 50, 60 people, depending on, on what it is. Um, am I missing it? And then, you know, there's, there's everything design. else. I mean, yeah, design is the other big piece of this. So like once creatives, strategists, producers have all come together and what the idea actually is, what we're going to build, designers are the ones who then make it come to life as, as, uh, as the visual. Um, there's, you know, the 3D model of what it's going to look like. And then those designs that get passed to fabricators, so fabricators actually know what to build. Um, but then there's the graphic design, all the different, you know, textures and surfaces and all that that needs to be designed so that, that it comes to life as well. Signage, everything from, from that you can see there. Um, but yeah, it's a, it, it becomes a pretty, uh, pretty sizable team if it's a pretty big production as well. And let's well, we not forget kind of social. I think social also has a great deal to, maybe not with right. Lovecraft, but for, for South by Southwest, well, for sure. Right. Yeah, we, we, we look at these things like they're also a bit of like, they're, they're a set that we're designing for content. So we might shoot some of our own content there as well. So we, we're gonna have a social team, you know, video producers, people you know, actually on camera shooting things so that we can package that, that up, build assets that then people can share out on social. But we're also gonna share it from probably the HBO account out to the world. So there's, there's, we expand to all of these different areas to, to build it out. So there's some good questions coming in here. Um, the first one is from Fatima. Uh, how do you reassure clients on their media budgets and encourage spending on experiences? That's a good one. It's uh, we've we've built a bit of a track record now where there's they have to trust that like we've we've done this before. We know what it's going to take in order to make an impact. But there's only so much that you can do. You can't like build a model that's going to say, if you spend this amount of money, you're going to get this kind of return on it. 
it's still marketing in general is just it doesn't work like that maybe just like search marketing and things you know little things like that might but not when you're getting really creative and you're coming up with these big ideas there's just a lot of risk involved um so the only thing we the, the stuff that we can do to reassure them is we can we can visualize it as much as possible for them and then we can say and we're going to have uh, we might have uh, a crew of influencers who are going to come through and they're going to shoot content. So we have built an audience that's going to be reached through that. We're going to have uh, a PR team that's involved to make sure that the, the press is going to cover something. But there's, there's only so much that we can do and there's only so much that they can be reassured before they actually have to make you know, a, a risk assessment on it themselves and say, this is worth us doing. And they have to look at all the benefits of it. Um, because there's, you know, there's uh, with things like this, we want to get people to tune into a TV show. So we can show them that like we've done this before and people have tuned into TV shows after we've done these things. But there's other benefits. There's you know, the press value of doing this for uh, the sake of you know, HBO needs to attract more producers and directors and actors to, to work with HBO. One of the things that they do is they, they spend money on marketing because they want to make sure that the directors and the, the creators of TV shows, they go to HBO and they try to bring their show there because they know that HBO is going to put money behind actually getting the word out about it. So they, they look at it through a lot of different lenses as well. And just to add to that too, I think once we get to that point where they're signed on to wanting to do something and wanting to go, you know, with one of our high level ideas, um, really the next step is just like our clients trust us. They, they were transparent. We show what we think, is a good value. We show what we think, like, if you really want, you know, here's options. Do you want, this is fine. This is great. This is more. Um, and it's just like a dialogue and a conversation that we have with them that they know we have their best interests in mind. We have the project's best interests in mind and we're, you know, spending responsibly. We're looking for the best partners. We, you know, if we, you know, are changing things or updating things that will be in touch, there's not going to be any surprises. So once you know we get sign off it's really just like nourishing that that relationship where they just trust us to you spend their money wisely mm -hmm. so so it sounds like you do pitch the client multiple levels of what this project could look like do they always give you a budget up front or do you usually do that first we uh more often we're saying we need to know a budget up front yeah right and then there's you know many times where a client says I don't know, come up with some ideas. If, if it's a good enough idea, we'll find the money for it. And that has not worked out well for us many times. So we, we sort of started to say no to that, where we tell the client now, give us a range at least, and we'll come back to you with a different, you know, tiers of what it's something could be, or, you know, just tell us what your max is and we can build to that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, now, now at this point, we're saying to clients, you, know, you need to tell us what, what a budget is so that then we can build to it. And so I assume that you pivoted with Lovecraft Country. How different was Lovecraft country experience going to be before COVID? Um, Taylor's asking this question. What, what was your experience like making all those changes? Sure, kind of crazy. Yeah. Uh, Sarah, you can take this one. So amazingly, uh, we, prior to COVID at the end of 2019, we're actually discussing, we, I think we were still in the phase where we had like a few different options about how we could execute this. Um, but one of our top ideas was actually doing a drive-in movie. Uh, so that was, you know, based on just that it was in the 50s, they wanted to do a screening, seems like a cool thing to do. Uh, so that stuck around, but obviously, you know, it changed a lot. And, you know, initially they were getting out of their car, you know, there were things that they would go and explore. Um, and so we, our, our main like pivot in this case was to really create an in-car experience that still felt fully immersive and like you were in the world. Um, so that was, you know, probably the biggest challenge of that. And just like reassuring all of up the entire ladder at HBO that, you know, this was as risk-free as it possibly could be. Yeah, I, originally this was gonna come out, I think early summer of last year because we were starting to see that cases were going down for a minute. So we were like, all right, we're gonna put it out there. And this concept was already ready and built. We had, we had a drive-in experience already done. It was just a matter of figuring out those extra state steps that we needed to take to make sure it was safe. Um, but it was already sort of pre-built. It would have been probably the first experience to come out during, during COVID that uh, was, was a drive-in experience for, for a brand. 
So I, I love Shivani is asked to everyone is really and even behind the scenes in our Discord channel, they're all talking about, oh my God, it's so detailed, it's so detailed. Um, so I think you're uh, I think they have questions about like, you got a big picture idea, but then yeah. you've thought of every little detail. And those are really two different skill sets. Are, right. Do you have like a strategy or ways of thinking or different people on your team to, to account for all those details? Hmm. I think it starts with like, I mean, we, we also check out the competition a lot. We go through experiences and, and not just the competition, the other agencies that are building experiences, but we will go to, you know, the team went to go check out Meow Wolf in Santa Fe a little while ago. They'll go and see any pop-up, anything that pop up pops up anywhere, um, just to go see what it is and like learn and, and, you know, soak in like what little details someone else might be paying attention to. And then we'll take that back. But the key part of it is like, we go and experience those things so that we know what to look for. And then when, when we're building our experiences, we put ourselves in the shoes of the person that is gonna be walking through this experience. And not just like the walkthrough, but like they get the invitation to it. What does that look like? How is, what, what does it feel like? What's the, is it, you know, does it include a token inside? Whatever it might be, like we try to think of it through, through their eyes as much as we possibly can. So it's, it is just like, it's building these as, as their consumer centric experiences. Put yourself in the shoes of the consumer as they're walking through these things. And you'll say, I think this is missing or that's missing. Uh, and it's not any one group or anyone in particular. It's, it's everyone sort of like, that's how we look at everything that we do. You're gonna go through this experience too. So make sure it's what you would have wanted to go through. Uh, and if you can make it so good that you would have even paid to go to this experience. And I think that's like another level that we try to think of things uh, through that lens where like, if I, I think I had heard that someone was selling like their ticket to go to Westworld for a couple hundred bucks on eBay, like that, that's a sign that we did it right. Like there's, there's a demand for something and there's, and there's so much excitement for something because they know it's so good. We have to think of those things that are going to make it so good that people would actually pay for it. Yeah. I mean, it starts as an outline and the details get filled in. You know, we have sometimes in the very early concept phases, someone thinks of a detail that seems so small in comparison to what's overall going to happen but like that becomes like a linchpin of, of what you know the the that part of the experience is going to be or those things wind up either sticking around or they morph into other things um, but i think you know there's a couple other elements that really help with that one just having like great communication and collaboration between our teams really being open to hear from anyone even on this event we had this like idea where we were going to send key swipes that were going to be encapsulated in a ticket to all of the um, invitees and that was going to be their check-in instead of the intercom and that it was going to be like an RFID kind of thing but it would be masked to, and we really got hung up on that idea because it was part of the invitation package it was going to be really cool they were going to pull up somehow it would swipe it would know who they were it would go into the photo system etc cetera, etc cetera. and it just we were having challenges with getting the invite list you know and then our coordinator who has been you know is two years out of college said, why are we so hung up on this key card idea? What if we did an intercom, you know? And so we brought that to the team and we said, what do you guys think about this? And I said, yeah, we were just stuck in this tunnel vision of this mm -hmm. idea because we've been with it for so long. Anyone can like, pop up and say, you know, what about this? I think the other thing too is, um, is having really good partnerships with our vendors and our suppliers. Um, you know, we know, me as a producer, you know, I know enough about lighting, enough about projection to know what questions to ask, basic things to look for, but I'm not a projectionist. You know, I don't know what the newest model of a lamp is that you attach to the thing to make it brighter. Uh, but having really solid partners who will come to us with a list of questions and say, do you want it like this or like that? Like this or like that? I mean, they, we create an environment with them where they're offering us things that we might not have even considered because we didn't know about them. So having those really good, healthy, collaborative relationships with our partners as well um, helps to fill in a lot of those details. Fantastic. Know your strengths. Uh, we're always, I'm always saying that with the teams, you know, it's like you don't need to know everything on the team. Right. You got to bring the different expertise together. Um, to make, to formulate this. So, you know, speaking about um, the, and I love also, Sarah, what you said about, um, 
you know, that you just, you let it go. You know, when you see so much friction in one space, sometimes it's okay to kill those babies and start again, right. you know, it's super important. Um, Janelle was asking about uh, how do you select who gets the experience, gets to experience these events. I think that's really important because, yeah. you know, I've always been lucky to go to these type of events at South by Southwest, but it it is, it's also a limited amount of people that can attend at a certain time certain place um yep. how do you how do you make sure everyone feels like they can participate each one's a little bit different because it's also driven by the client sometimes so yeah. what, what they're looking to get out of it uh, or where they want to show up and and a bit of the the goals are a little bit different each time too so uh we've done everything from truly open just stand in line and you can get into the experience situations like uh we built for blade runner uh, when that movie came out a little while ago, uh, this crazy experience at Comic Con a couple years ago, where you got to like walk through, walk through what it, you know, 2049 Los Angeles. Uh, it was just stand in line, and people stood in line for, I I think like eight hours. It was ridiculous. Like, but I think there was also there was something to that that like they stood in line for eight hours. It created more buzz about it because people were like, why are people waiting in line for eight hours for this thing? So like it fed on itself a little bit and we could only do what we could do. Like we, the experience could only fit so many people in at one time. So it wasn't, um, it's, that's funny. Um, there's like, it, there, there's something to that, that like when you're standing in line, that's part of the experience as well, for sure. The, we do have, I mean, there's the, the ultimate goal at the end of the day is to get as many people to talk about and experience and feel it and do it as we possibly can. Um, sometimes though, it, it's, it's also just to get the, the talk about part really amped up. So we will prioritize and we'll make sure and we'll work with the clients to make sure that talent uh, can walk through the experience because they've got huge social following. So like they're gonna come through the experience. They've had something to do with the show or the movie. So like they need to see it as well, but they're gonna share it. And that's, it. we have to like somehow prioritize that in that as well. So we'll work with, um, influencers, people with huge following on social to come through. And we've got, sometimes there's a VIP line that has sort of a special access where we can get through uh, people to get them through it quicker. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it is ultimately about getting as many people to know about the experience as possible. So we try to get as many people to experience it as possible, but sometimes it's really just about getting people with, with a social following to come through it uh, as well as press. And, and we'll, we'll make sure that like press is prioritized in those things as well. I think also, um, you know, understanding who's coming uh, and who the goal is to have come from the beginning when we start concepting has a lot to do with, you know, how we think about how it's going to operate, you know, what is the throughput, you know, is it supposed to be a ton of people that yeah. totally can change what the flow of the experience is going to be like, or is it supposed to be tight groups coming through to really have like a one-on-one -on -one experience? If we have, a, you know, if the goal is to just, is foot traffic, we have to think about how that event's going to be set up completely mm -hmm. differently because yep. we need it the space to be able to accommodate as many people as physically possible. Um, and there's pros and cons, you know, the foot traffic of the high foot traffic events, you have to have create a little more distance between the attendees and the experience because there's more people there. But you got more eyes on it. So how do you bring those people in when they're in huge crowds into an experience? Or if the priority is just getting the right people in, you can do you can have five people in a space at a time and have actors talking to them and interacting. And you know, it really comes down to scale and budget. Westworld's an example where it was sort of both, but you know, that's it's it's really just about understanding who's supposed to be coming through, what the throughput goals are what the, you know, but the goals for buzz and, you know, who the target demographic is and where it's set. Is this a South by? Is this at Comic-Con? Is this a standalone event that's happening? Just pop? Is this some, something related to like a trade show? Is this a cocktail party for X amount of people? I mean, I think there's, you know, understanding all of those goals from the beginning what helps really helps us really set up, you know, the appropriate uh, concept from, from the get-go. Great. Well, last question, and then I think we should switch so the students can present to you and um, get your feedback. Um, so this is from Vicki. Um, after the experience, was there any feedback y'all received that really stuck out? So from either of those case studies you shared with us, uh, something that stuck hmm. out maybe you took with you going forward. Sarah, you got any? 
oh, I mean, I can just tell you guys that for me, um, you know, as a producer who's been working on something for a super long time, like I just take everything so much to heart. Like, even if it's just an offhand comment that I know that at the end of the day, like that person just like was obsessed with the experience yeah. and had the best time. But even someone coming up and saying like, I don't know where to turn to turn my car uh, is like devastating to me. I'm like, they should know, you know, I should have had that perfectly planned. So I think, you know, for us and in this Lovecraft example specifically, um, I'm, I can tell you, I could look at a floor plan and tell you there's going to be a um, bottleneck here. People are going to dwell long here. People are going to breeze by that. If you really want them to stop and see something here, you better put it like this. Like, I really understand how people walking flows are going to work in a space. I've just observed it so many different times, but having people be in their cars there, it's not the same entity as a person standing in line and walking someone behind the wheel just operates differently. And the things that I instinctively know where to put wayfinding signage, how to direct them, um, you know, how to make sure they know what path to follow was a completely new experience. And we guessed. And so, you know, we had a, a really smart team on site that after, you know, the first 20 cars came in, we go, oh boy, like these people are confused. Let's mm -hmm. move this here. Let's put some more cones there. And we snuck around and reconfigured a little bit um, to make it just like a seamless experience. So, you know, I think as far as feedback goes, the feedback was great. People loved it. They were sharing it. They were, you know, raving about it. But I take even just someone looking confused as uh, as feedback that I need to fix something. Some of the, the best experiences we do too are, are when fans can go through them. So like Comic-Con experiences, there's just something extra special about it because there are so many fans walking around of the property that you might be working on. So like that Blade Runner example, I remember, I don't know how, but like someone did the experience every single day. And it was not a different experience every single day, but they, they found me afterwards because I think I had, I had a headset on. So they knew I worked somehow in the, in the, on the property. And they came up and they said, like, I came here every single day. And I've, I just can't tell you, like, it just keeps getting better and better. I'm like, there's nothing changing about this, but that's amazing that you're finding like the value in coming and experiencing this and you're a fan of Blade Runner to, to that degree and you just love it. Like that's, that's pretty cool for sure. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much. This has been very informative and I, and I hope it, um, I hope all the students got something out of it. Um, so switching gears, uh, what you're gonna do is you're gonna hear uh, three presentations. Uh, two of them are from Eyes on the Sky. So they had two client briefs. One was Eyes on the Sky, which is um, a new project that we're getting off the ground here at UT Austin hmm. uh, with Maura Baja, who is an astrophysicist and also known as a space environmentalist. And our goal is to, kind of the brief was to um, encourage the public to learn about space environmentalism. It's a very invisible, wicked problem that no one understands. Mm -hmm. So you'll, you'll hear about that one. And then the other one is I was the client at, because Texas Immersive is new. Um, and so we want to, we wanted to create uh, an immersive like experiential marketing experience to get others to learn about Texas Immersive and what it means. Cause it's still so new. It's not a program out there at other universities. So a lot of yeah. students know, what is it? Um, so that, that team is gonna share with you there. Um, so to get, so which would you like to hear first? <laughs> uh, let's do, let's do space environmentalism. Okay, great. So I'll have the Eyes on the Sky team present and then let's end with the Horn Razor team um, after the experience. Sound good? Cool. Great. Sounds good. And hi, I'm Fatima. I'm going to be driving the PowerPoint. Um, I think, Aaron, if we are linking outside of the PowerPoint, should I share my entire desktop? Is that how it works? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, I think y'all are gonna see yourselves. Did it work? Yep, you're good. Okay, awesome. Just uh, making sure. Fatima, make sure you click on share for sounds. So like- Yeah, I got that. Okay, well, like I said, I'm Fatima. Um, I will be driving this presentation. Uh, 
And we're really happy that y'all are here. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to come give us feedback. And also, I'm sure you catch the vibes, but we all really enjoyed the presentation that you gave as well. So definitely has the gears um, turning for our experience. So what is Eyes on the Sky? Aaron kind of touched on this earlier, but it is the first of its kind in extended reality experiences targeted towards people to gain advocacy for space environmentalism. Um, and the idea behind space environmentalism, as you see from our logo kind of visualized here, is that there are half a million pieces of space junk, whether that's debris or satellites around the Earth's atmosphere, and this is becoming an increasingly dangerous environment. Um, as Moriba put in one of his videos, a Piece, a piece of debris that's the size of a speck of paint going at the right speed could render entire space stations useless. Um, it could actually like become an issue of life or death. It could put people on space stations in danger. It could potentially compromise our satellites. So it's a really important issue, but it's not visible to us from Earth. So for this experience, we want to essentially promote the Eyes on the Sky extended reality experience by doing an experiential marketing thing that will um, ultimately lead people back to this XR experience that is in the development phase right now. Um, so for our experiential marketing um, experience that we're creating, our purpose statement is to create an approachable interactive experience that introduces space environmentalism um, in a way that promotes shareability. So things that are really important to us are that this is mobily optimized. This experience is going to be um, completely virtual, but with that being said, we want it to lead to more resources. Uh, we want it to be engaging, well contextualized and personally relevant. Uh, and the way that we've sort of thought about this is we wanna start really small because a lot of people don't understand the scale of how catastrophic this could be. So we're gonna start with a menial inconvenience and we'll see in the experience that for each of the characters, it ramps up to sort of this global scale impact. So in terms of our audience, we are targeting people who inherently have a direct stake in space environmentalism, which to be completely honest, is every single person. Um, but specifically, we are targeting digital natives, environmentalists, and space enthusiasts. And the people we're targeting through this marketing experience are people who are unaware that space environmentalism is a thing. And we essentially want them to see how important it is to bring attention to this so we can get them to be advocates, push for policy, um, possibly donate to our horn raiser, and join the conversation. And I will pass this on to Ansley to talk about development. Hey guys, um, I'm Ansley and I'm on the development team for our experience. Um, so essentially we decided on Echo Studio as our platform to create this um, because it allows us to have that choose your own adventure type storyline that we as a team decided we wanted to go for. Um, it is really easy to make interactive videos on the application. And it's also um, very accessible and user friendly, which is a big plus, um, especially since our audience is going to be more general. Um, we have those character profiles, but like Fatima said, we this is a problem for everyone. So we wanted to make sure that also it worked on mobile um, because a lot of the other applications we could have chosen um, weren't able to be mobile compatible enough for us to be like reassured in them. And then um, what's really important for us is also that it's video and audio compatible um, because we are planning on making a live first action point of view series. Um, and I'll talk about our audio and video production now. Um, so we want to do a, a POV storyline and then we want to film those videos so that that way there's consistency between all the shots and it feels like the user is actually like going through these situations that we put them in. Um, we plan on using a GoPro and then we're going to add visual effects in. Um, our kind of theme will be low saturation, um, black and white style. We'll, we have a mood board that we'll show you guys too. Um, we want to have immersive audio um, and then in post we're going to do After Effects and Premiere Pro to kind of chop everything together and get it perfect. 
Thanks, Ansley. So what our big idea is with this is that in the same way that if a satellite were to go down in space, we wouldn't see it happen. We would just experience the impacts of it. We are going to keep our characters in this experience in the dark. So we're gonna let them sit in the suspense so they can experience this as if it were happening in real time. Oh, also Fatima, can you click that link on the last thing really quick? Sorry, yeah. I, this is just to show you guys what um, Echo is capable of. BuzzFeed made a quiz using Echo. Um, so it also shows that brands have used this and it worked. But um, just if, <laughs> if it keeps playing, it, it'll just show that you can like click um. It's like a choose your own adventure sort of like mm -hmm. this path and they build a whole tree. That's cool. Yeah. And it, it's really good at utilizing like videos. Um, so each thing that you choose corresponds with a different video and really brings you into the story. Right. That's cool. Yeah. Um, do you want me to keep playing it, Ansley? I wasn't sure if the audio was cutting off. Um, I think, I mean, we can, um, it was really loud. So <laughs> that was we got, it. we got it. We okay. got it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so, um, moving on to our mood board, like Ansley said, um, we were going for sort of a low saturation to black and white kind of transition throughout this experience, because we wanted to really, capture that kind of eerie unsettling feeling of losing connectivity and not really being in the loop so to to help build that suspense um you see here some references of first person perspective which is what our shots would look like and then these other shots kind of capture tonally what we are trying to evoke in terms of like allowing our audience to feel confused and feel a little unsettled um, so they can fully feel the impact of what would happen if our satellites were to be compromised. And then, as we said earlier, we do have a target audience and we wanted to manifest our target audience in the characters that we flushed out for this experience. And so that ended up becoming a Twitch streamer to represent our digital native, an astronomy professor to represent our space enthusiast and a park ranger to represent our environmentalist. And we have a fun little demo for you. I'm gonna pass it off to AJ and he can walk you through our demo for our Twitch streamer character, which I think is our favorite right now. Hey, oh, my name is AJ. I'm on the writing team and I will be narrating you through this experience with one of my writers, my fellow writers, Brooke. Um, can I possibly get a volunteer from Giant Spoon? Just anyone, just wondering. That's me. All right. Nice <laughs> to meet you, Mark. Nice to meet you. And guys, I don't know if you guys actually know this, but Mark is an influential Twitch streamer. So we're going to go down their journey and see how, see how his life is. So we open up with the view of a computer monitor. And it's dimly lit, and there's LED lights, and there's three live viewers. And you hear the loud clacking of an Xbox controller going through the chaos of the game. And then you hear Mark say, hey, guys, welcome back to my stream. We're on the road to 1 million subs. Make sure to donate so I can get a Tesla. There's a view of the chat and the viewers are typing hello, sounds and notifications going off. Mark, what do you do next? Do you say hi to the viewers or do you beg for donations? Again. Let's say hi to the viewers. Nice choice, okay. So you say, hey, awesome sauce 64 you know, it's always nice to see you type in and you get a donation. Oh, you're finally gonna get to invest in that Tesla. So you get started, but then you hear a beep of the microwave and you know, you know what time it is. So you put your hot pocket break sign in front of your stream. You go get your hot pocket from your conveniently placed bedroom microwave. You take a bite and ah, you burn yourself. What do you do next? Do you go downstairs for some water or do you deal with the pain and get back to the game? Let's, let's deal with this pain. Okay, okay. Love to see it. So as you return to the game, the page is unresponsive and appears to be frozen. After shaking your monitor in frustration, you begin to worry about when you last saved the game. You're forced to find a new course of action. What do you do next? <laughs> let's check the router first. Okay. So there's no signal. So as you stand in the room, you start to develop an eerie view of the situation. 
you'll get your phone, the TV, the router, the radio, but notice as you scan across the room, nothing is responding and you get an ominous feeling starting to overwhelm you. And that says white noise sequence. So this is where the immersive audio is gonna start coming in. Ideally, they'll be wearing headphones or they'll be in some stereo um, atmosphere where we can have cool panning come in and like white noise start to creep in slowly and overwhelm the audio. So what do you do next? Do you go see if your neighbors are okay or do you grab your car keys and get out? Let's, let's check on the neighbors. Okay, very altruistic. Um, so you zoom out and you see all three characters now. You walk outside and you immediately hear the worry chatter of your neighbors. As the noise crescendos, the scene cuts to a small montage of first responders unable to hear their operators. The back to you with a hush as you see someone slowly point to the sky. You hear a loud, deep drone and see an airplane descend overhead as well as multiple airplanes circling above you. What do you do next? Get out of there. Take, Take cover. cover. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> So now the video zooms out one final time and we see a view of the whole world watching entire cities start to black out as power grids are shut down and the world goes dark. This next sequence is gonna be text with no narration. With hundreds of thousands of man-made objects cluttering the earth's atmosphere, our satellites are at a constant risk of being compromised. If this disruption continues, each day will bring new challenges, and what you just experienced will start to resemble a dark reality. We can help mitigate these risks. Could this really happen? Yes, if everything failed at once, which is unlikely. What is certain is that the infrastructure we all rely on has become increasingly dependent on space technology. Without the appropriate regulations and policy change, we are passively waiting for the next global catastrophe. Just because the problem isn't on Earth doesn't mean we should wait until it is. This poses the last question, what will you do next? So we'll be redirecting our audience to a splash screen at this option, giving them their final choice in real life. They can choose to play again and try out another narrative branch. They can act by sending out an automated email to Congress in support of space regulation. They can donate to our cause, they can join us on social media, and they can learn by accessing other Eyes on the Sky uh, branded experiences later on down the line. That's cool. Yeah, so this is our Inkle Writer. This is our interactive script. Now that we've played through that, I'm just going to walk you through two more of our other unique character profiles that we've come up with. Um, the first is from the perspective of a passionate astronomy professor who shares their knowledge of the love of the stars with their 10-year-old daughter. With increasingly concerning reports of imminent dangers of space junk coming to light, this arc follows this duo looking out into the night sky with their telescope, exploring the lost ecosystem above them. Unlike the previous arc, this character has an emotional connection to the stars. And our second is told from the perspective of a park ranger, who goes the extra mile to weave sustainable practices in all of their tours and lesson plans. They ensure that everyone they cross paths with comes away with an understanding of how their actions directly affect the earth. Now, this one is intentional with their environmental activism, but they're not necessarily connected to space environmentalism next. So we settled on these three character profiles, not only by demographic, but by degrees of known involvement in space environmentalism. We believe that these three uh, characters allow us to engage our different targets by empowering them not only within the choose your adventure style story, but with their actions going forward beyond the experience. Um, now I'm gonna hand this off to Fatima to walk us through the general flow of the experience. Yeah, so each character will have a unique pathway um, that will actually ultimately result in the same global catastrophe blackout. So we have outlined a flow chart here um, that is just very general in terms of how the characters will move through the choose your own adventure story. Uh, overall, we want this experience to be no more than three minutes. And we've kind of made the framework to, to where it goes through six sequences. So six, set of, six sets of choices. Um, each set of choices will come with sort of a 30 second scenario with 15 seconds being video clips and 10 seconds to be kind of them choosing what they want to do next. And hopefully this will be seamless, kind of like what you've seen with Bandersnatch, where we record extra video to fill in that gap of when they're choosing. Mm -hmm. And um, as I mentioned, the first three sequences are unique to each character. So they're really helping build and develop the character. 
But because we're sort of limited in our resources and being able to film with the COVID-19 protocols and things, our last three sequences are going to be the same for every single character, which is intentional because we want to show that regardless of what your knowledge is in this issue, um, the scale of how catastrophic this impact can be um, is essentially going to affect everybody. So by the end of the experience, you see the three characters walk out of their houses and it's sort of a bridging point where everybody is kind of being impacted by the same thing. Cool. And then here is our storyboard. These are just for those last three sequences that will be similar between the three characters. You have the white noise sequence when things start to really ramp up and feel kind of unsettling. Um, and then the neighborhood view where regardless of what character you are, you'll see all characters step out. Um, and this is sort of like the bridging moment. And then finally the global blackout where you'll start to see cities shut down. And then I'll pass it on to Olivia to talk about our UX. Hi everyone, um, here's an example of our wireframes for the experience, um, showcasing the UI for this experience on mobile. Um, we're developing this through Echo Studio and we want the UI for this experience to be very minimal and not distract from the experience as a whole. So our players get um, really immersed in this experience. Here you'll see we're gonna, we're gonna have a title splash um, you can also see our choice screen that has a little bar telling you how long you have to make a choice. And then at the end, we're going to have choices where you can choose what to do next. And those will take you to like our website um, or our horn raiser. Um, and yeah, and then Fatima can show us the trailer for this experience. Yep, so um, we have created a trailer and our purpose for creating the trailer is we want it to double as something we can use as promotion on social media. So this is one iteration of what it would look like if we were hosting this on TikTok. Um, but we want to do iterations for all of the other social media platforms so we can have a wide reach with our many disparate audience members. So our big idea here is we want to kind of utilize the fact that our mobile device is something that we are all very attached to and it's sort of the first thing that would have an impact on us if it if it went like if you don't have your phone it kind of comes with this sense of urgency and panic so we want to create kind of like fake out ads um, where you would be watching regular content on these platforms and then you'll see the screen start to glitch and buffer um, and then you realize that this is an this is an ad for an experience that is trying to mitigate some of these risks of losing connectivity. So here is a TikTok version of that. This is Ansley. Free interactive games you should download. Oh, oh, oh. Cool. With half a million man-made objects surrounding the Earth's atmosphere. Our satellites are at constant risk of being compromised. If this continues, connectivity won't be the only issue. Without your help, each day will bring new challenges affecting all aspects of modern society. Free interactive games. <laughs> All right, and um, that's all we have for our presentation. We would love to answer any questions and hear any feedback you have for us. That's cool. That's great. Great job. Uh, I there's something about like that fear, like you you guys hit it right there. Like there's a fear, like a very personal part of this would be like figuring out how to take someone's phone away from them <laughs> or completely immobilize their phone like just com absolutely and it, like it immediately they're like i'm paying attention now because my phone doesn't work there's there's something there's something wrong what happened where, where how can i help so like i think like you're doing the right thing by like starting with that and then getting them through through that experience um the i think there's there you're, you're starting with like a digital stunt to start something is there any sort of physical stunt that could complement that that I don't know if it's like like maybe the same effects like there's some sort of experience we could we could build that 
makes it so your phone doesn't work when you walk into that experience and people are just freaking out because like their phone doesn't work for a second and like at some point they realize like it and we can tell that story through through that kind of experience so i'm trying to think of like ways that you could also bring this into a, a real life uh experience as well um what's the it, and this is a way we will look at it sometimes too the the headline about this this stunt this marketing activation that you guys do the headline that you would want to read in the new york times wall street journal like big press like what is that headline that you would have wanted to have seen that would have been like we did it i think probably the strongest line of copy that summarizes everything that we have so far is just because it's not on earth doesn't mean we should wait until it is. And then I think the what will you do next is sort of, I guess, a little fear mongering, but I think yep. that's going to be um, the tone that we want to lead with. Yep, that's great. Cool. Uh, Sarah or Gab, I think you're still on too, but any thoughts? Um, I thought this was great, you guys, um, but such a complete project together um the trailer like i mean that's really cool that um like all of those pieces were shown to us i think for me uh as as one piece of feedback would go i think by the end there were little pieces of like setting up what this was supposed to be that totally came together and i understand it now um but there was a, a, a little bit at the beginning when you were really like you obviously did so much research understanding you know like platforms and you know how to have this come together but i think like one extra slide of sort of giving me a heads up like this is what it's going to be would have helped me um in, ingest those details mm. um it with understanding more what what the ultimate goal was um and evaluating those you know with that knowledge instead of fig trying to guess like what's this gonna be for so I'm, I'm really impressed though i mean i think you guys it's really comprehensive it's really start to finish i think you you know thought about um you know what the whole experience is going to be um and even like how to promote it and, and get people interested i also thought the way that you set up the call to action to donate or participate like really felt like i was feeling like even just watching that come up on screen um really feeling like pressure to like do one of those things. I think it would be really hard to click out of that. Um, you sort of feel like a jerk, I think, if you don't pick one of the choices, which I think is like, you know, not in an, an offensive way, but in, in a motivating way. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be really cool at the end of this, if like the result was you got however many thousands of people to, to act on this. Donation's one thing, but just the like, the, the, they're going to do something, even if it's just the click of a button afterwards to, to, to say that like, this is a problem. And if we don't do something, not only is it going to affect our ability to connect with people and my phone's going to be not working anymore, but like, there's so much worse things that you can't even imagine that will happen as well. So yeah, this is great. And it's even like, you know, going into a family dinner and be like, did you guys hear about this? Like, problem I just learned about you know I think that yeah. getting people invested in understanding what a problem is spreads you know beyond even just what the activation is which you know I think if awareness is the ultimate goal then then that's what it, you know is being achieved yep I I don't know if gap is here or not um but I completely agree with you Sarah I think that was my one critique I wrote down was always start with story yeah. right so like kick when you're presenting especially to someone who is unaware of the whole thing begin with the story and hook them first you know so even perhaps bringing the promotional video up front and then just teasing it a little bit would have helped lay down the technology a little bit more yeah but very good very detailed i like that y'all all liked the action at the end yeah. the, the participate including the details of you don't have you can donate but you can also like write your congress yeah. you know yeah. was really good action um should we keep going uh so speaking of that great job y'all i think y'all did a really good job um, and and just so you know um mark and sarah uh the next eight weeks they will be building this uh, oh wow yeah, so so uh, if you came back to our Texas Immersive Showcase, it will be fully done um, and out to cool. the public, which is Very exciting. Cool. 
Awesome. Uh, you're getting a feel for what Texas Immersive is about. Um, and, I, and I must say that the students, when they first were designing experiences, they were thinking about an, an actual physical experiential marketing sure. piece. Yep. Um, but the university has really um, sh kind of shut us down this semester to getting together. Uh, yeah. uh, so I think they, I think that kind of switch, I feel like y'all learned that really not oh, yeah. being able to like get together as much about a few weeks ago. So they did a nice shift to doing yeah. something completely online. That's great. Um, let's, let's continue because uh, it builds upon this with the uh, horn raiser group. Uh, so, so for the, I you probably don't know what a horn raiser is, but it's UT's version of a Kickstarter campaign. Um, so it'll go right into the donate uh, part that launches. Hello, I'm Sarah. I just wanted to thank you guys for coming. So I'm going to share my screen really quick. Bear with me. And I have a lot of tabs open, so don't mind me. So we're going to go ahead and present on number one. Sorry, everyone. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, this is the horn raiser section. So we're all about the marketing of the whole Eyes on This Guy initiative. So I'm just going to start with imagine a world without communication. Imagine a world with chaos. And imagine 2020, 2021, how things are going. Imagine that uh, elevated. Eyes on the Sky is a story about humanity and the elements common to us all, our sky. Our goal is to educate, unite, and to inspire the world and beyond. So welcome to Eyes on the Sky meets Horn Razor. The University of Texas at Austin is uniting as one to shine light on the wicked problem of space junk. Our goal is to raise $75,000 over the next 10 weeks to develop assets, prototype, while, while um, securing, securing funding um, for prototyping and uh, distribution later down the road. Our goal is to have 3,000 plus impressions by the end of our fundraising phase, but um, if our PR release is successful, that could be hundreds and hundreds of thousands of impressions. Our start date is scheduled for March 23rd and end date May 18th. And so Eyes on the Sky is um, divided into three different phases for development. Uh, we are currently in phase one of development uh, raising $75,000 for prototyping. Phase two will be $500,000 uh, to come up with immersive pre-production. And then our last phase will be $3 million to um, have a full immersive experience uh, complete and ready for distribution and licensing. Um, so I'll be talking about our first target market, the environmental group. So we divided this market into two segments, space enthusiasts who are curious, unaware and aware, affluent and hardworking. Um, and then the greens who are environmentally conscious, they recycle on a daily basis. Um, they think about public transportation a lot. So um, taking rides together and getting away from fossil fuels to um, green energy and they're podcast fans and they have a balanced life. Um, also the greens, I do wanna mention, they like to save money. However, when they see a project that they really care about, um, they're going to not think twice about donating to that project. Our second tar target market, it's pioneers. So these are individuals ranging ages from 24 to 45. They are digitally savvy. So they are hyperactive on social media and other platforms. Um, they are, are environmentally conscious due to the, to the profound impact environmental issues that they have 
had on their lives and their on the next generation. They like they like to spend less and save more. So they're trying to avoid um, debt while simultaneously saving the earth. This category includes educators and entrepreneurs. Um, and they will watch their spending with hopes to avoid uh, the waste for our earth. Then our third target market, ter third target market is the Gen Z young professionals. Uh, this group makes up 30% of the global population. They are, they're also digital savvy. So they are digital experts. They mo they're most likely grew up with mobiles and iPads. So they don't remember like a time before the internet, unlike millennials. And they have a short attention span, span, which is just a second. So first impressions for this target audience really count. So looking, okay, you guys can't hear me, sorry. So looking into what's already been done, and this is keep in mind before launch date, which is in two weeks on March 23rd, that Tuesday, we've already raised over 35% of our goal. And we have tw 27 ambassadors and an audience of 400 and then access to key stakeholders and we're in contact with them. We have a PR strategy with key reporters, which Kyle will be um, talking more about in the later slide and email and social media assets built for both the ambassadors and like their audience. Yeah, I'm sorry. So what you can see here on the screen uh, is our online donation quantities and distributions over time prior to our launch date. Since the day we have started, donations have been growing up and um, going up, I'm sorry. And as you can see in, uh, on the middle, on February 17th, donations started to give it, to go even higher since we increased brand awareness. And we predict to have a linear growth after our launch date, which as Cal said, it's uh, the 23rd. So our online donations range from $71 to $271. Uh, we are aiming to leave uh, impressions around the whole world. As you can see in the middle column, we have already received some international donations um, from those countries. Our top countries right now are US, the US, Canada, United Kingdom, and Australia, since we have contacts in these countries and awareness has been spreading fast. But on the third and column to the right, you can see other three countries which are Alaska, India, and South Korea, which we're also having to plan, we're planning to have the same impact on these countries. These are the um, social, the um, our current like searches on in the locations you can see here. And as you can see, the audience sub reference site is directly through our website, which is the first one there on the screen. And then after looking into that, sorry, Kyle, <laughs> looking at our strategy for Hornraiser. So we kind of like divided them into three categories, socials, influence, and experiential. With social media, we have our own personal website and our own personal social account, but we're also providing um, the ambassadors with like eyes on the sky branded, like personal social contact con content, sorry, not contact for like on different, like multiple platforms. Cause we really wanted to get like cross channel and then for influence for the ambassadors, we're going to be sending them weekly content packages and like weekly updates and strategy and like projects progress. And we're kind of going to be providing them with everything they need to not like for when they're contacting like their audience and like when we're also contacting our own audience. And then for experiential, we're going to have like two big events, eyes on the sky meet and greet and then the Texas immersive, the Texas immersive experiences showcase. Yeah, and so I'll be talking about the public relations. Um, I have started coming up with a robust strategy um, when I've been putting together the kit that we're going to pitch to reporters. I've been keeping in mind that we're going to portray this Eyes on the Sky project as an international movement, um, thinking how diversity plays into this. So not only from we have a diverse team um, of leaders, such as like Marie Bajaw, um, 
and we have a women entrepreneur. Um, we're also thinking about from an equity and inclusion standpoint, since this is an international audience, um, to make sure we don't leave people out. Um, we have an award-winning team, uh, making sure that we emphasize the dangers. And we even thought about the moral right. Like It's morally right to um, put awareness into the public about something that could have a catastrophic effect on the whole world. Um, we don't see governments putting light on this issue. If you go ask your friends, they're most likely gonna say, I had no clue. And that's a problem. Um, and so from that, I have created a um, media outreach with key um, outlets that we're going to be pitching to, Forbes, which we already have a contact uh, from Back Media, Real Screen, TechCrunch, IGN, VR Scout, um, and CNET are some of the most important key Alex that we will be pitching to. I'm sorry for my dog barking, everyone. So here's our social calendar, and I just kind of broke it down into like weekly and special. So weekly, we're going to have, like we're going to be kind of like hitting it heavy during this like time period because this like fundraiser is only for those couple or like those 10 weeks. So we're always going to be having like call to action stories, but then for the special ones, we have student interview videos that we're going to be making. And then with our events, the meet and greet and the showcase, we have IG like Instagram takeovers um, getting scheduled and then launch date and end date are very like are going to be like those big special like events for promotion. And then bi-weekly, we're going to be having quote posts from like interviews with Moriba and really trying to get the audience to know more, like not only more about the like about the project and the problem, but also about the team that's behind it. Yeah. Um, and so some of the best practices. So uh, the Hornraiser team is going to ensure that we have fun, but take risk and look at analytics um, and make sure we take calculated risks to make better decisions, um, see what is trending, looking through platforms like Net Red Netlytic, we can analyze, um, for example, we could analyze NASA's followers and come up with trends on our key audiences, um, looking at micro influencers and letting them know that their network will care, um, posting across channel, visual heavy, um, include a clear call to action, tell our story cohesively across channels, and focus on our target audiences. Um, there you oh, sorry. Go ahead, Tom. No, you can go. <laughs> so these are some examples of our socials or social assets that we have right now. Um, we have there like a, a little challenge and also like some of for our launch date on the left. And then Sarah, do you have anything to add to that? And then um, going along with this, we're going to be having, sorry, we're going to be having some of the ambassadors like they can, we're going to be giving them like templates where they can like fill in stuff as well. Like I am passionate about this. I believe in this project because of this. And then um, Louisa made this one where like today was special because like I was able to call my parents and like it was all because of like the satellites and global action for our global home. So we're really gonna be trying to like emphasize a lot of like the importance of this project and really trying to unite like everyone to like believe that it's like the same problem. And then um, this slide's just to show some like important questions that we've been thinking about while we're um, coming up with the strategy and just kind of even before launch date, things that we're considering. So looking into what is like eyes on the sky, thinking about like why people should care and why people should donate to this project. And so um, to close it off, um, eyes on the sky desires for hearts, minds, and eyes to look upward, protecting and preserving our earth and space for generations to come. And we are three inspired Longhorns hoping to make this project a reality. And then we also have a eyes on the sky horn raiser video. I'm not sure. I can just put the link in the chat. I don't know if there's enough time to watch the video, but 
Yeah, that'd be good. I think put it in the chat would be good. Okay, awesome. Thank you guys for listening. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Feedback? Cool. So who, who is the audience for this deck, this, this presentation in particular? Like... Yeah, so uh, the three target audiences um, as we went. So um, for, yeah, so target audiences, the Greens, environmentalists, um, Gen Z, those are our, our main target audiences, but yeah. the, also um, Mariba, which, is the one who really introduced us to this wicked problem. Yep. Um, so we're trying to move away from a general audience to narrowing down on our first um, three audiences that we're gonna tackle. And we're letting them spread awareness to other markets. Um, we're just gonna go plan how this unfolds and we'll make um, adjustments as we go. Got it, okay. Yeah, but I would I would add um, uh, this is coming before the immersive experience launches that right. you saw previously. Gotcha. You know, so these are all this is just general like reach out and start kind of teasing right, it. Right, right. Yep. And then on in May when the immersive experience that you just saw comes alive, yeah. builds on top of that. Yeah, whether you're a donor or actually you're just learning about it, you get further dive in. Into got it. it perfect yeah. okay great uh, um when we got our 27 ambassadors those ambassadors are from multiple industries entrepreneurs um educators and then recent graduates and that was strategically arranged so mm -hmm. we're we're reaching a diverse uh, set yeah. of people right cool yeah this so this feels more like this is the strategy that you guys are putting in place that's that's going to get the ball rolling you're going to start figuring out, okay, here's, here's who we're reaching. Here's how we're going to reach them. Even what we're going to say to them. Then comes that next step of like, and here's this stunt, this other, this, this idea that we're taking people through. So they really understand what it is. I think you can probably, you can, knowing where it's going to go, you can pull some of that. It's a bit of fear mongering. You can, you can pull it in to, to this up front um, and start to make those questions a bit more, uh, about like the what if like you started it with that deck too like the imagine the like you know the world and maybe the same thought on this one where like you could use headlines to paint that picture so like make a fake new york times front page of like what happened even if the, i don't know the new york times could put out a front page if this happened but, like those kinds of things just like set the tone that, like what you're about to see is like setting up a huge problem that's up, that's in front of us um, and there is something that you can do, but you have to, you have to pay attention. You have to act in this and you sort of walk them through that whole, that whole process. Once you've, you've sort of gotten their attention with something pretty, pretty crazy at the front. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get it. That's great. Yeah. I liked how holistic your, your plan was, um, leading up to the event. What I, what, what I do, what I personally think of being the comms manager at Giants Food a lot is I totally understand your audience. Sometimes in the lead up to an event, I like to think of my audience as reporters themselves. Mm. So if you're trying to get the attention of one key reporter, for instance, say it's New York Times, let's take them on that journey. Let's scare them a little bit. So giving them those key assets, give, giving them those insights into what this world could be so that they can write the story you want and then hopefully cover the event in the, in the weeks to follow. Just something to think about. Um, I also, the first thing that caught my eye was I think your goal was 3,000 impressions. Was that right? Yes. Um, and so we really got that number from as like the bare minimum that it would be possible to get the 75,000. But we realized that that could be heightened exponentially with our PR initiatives yeah. and the target audience that's spreading awareness themselves. It's yeah. totally higher than that. And I'm glad you know that. You have all of these ambassadors, you have all yeah. this, these press ideas. It's in like probably like the hundred thousands perhaps, if, if not more. Um, and being as though your budget, I'm just thinking of like a client relationship, your budget is 3 million. They're gonna wanna see a lot more impressions than three, uh, 3,000, I guess you could say. So just something to think about too. 
Um, but I loved it. I thought, I thought it was really smart, but I agree just like teasing those, those little bits in the upfront. And even I love, um, sorry, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm on a tear a little bit, but, um, I loved your slide on the key, the important questions at the end. I would even argue that that can be the basis of your sort of like press release. Mm -hmm. I think it's really smart the way you're thinking of your diversity bullets you have, who's on your team, et cetera. But what are like the two or three things you want the reporter to know right away um, and flesh those out is what I would say. Yeah, I, really I, I was gonna, oh, go ahead, Kyle. Um, I really liked what you said um, about like bringing in assets from the team that's making the guest marketing campaign to like scare the audience a little bit. So even bringing that trailer into um, promotion earlier uh, would be a really good idea in looking at how can we scare the audience a little bit to bring them in. Thank you for that. Um, yes, Kyle, I think that was a really good answer. Um, even like, you know, the trailer and the little glitching part, like maybe your ambassadors could get involved somehow. I think, you know, collaboration when you guys ultimately have the same mission is just like so useful. Gab, I was going to say the exact same thing about that slide with the questions. I thought those were really, really thoughtful um, and really good, like internal guiding points in addition to, you know, as an ex, uh, expository as well. Um, and I think I would, you know, I think you guys could have even like picked out a few of the bigger ones and and given a, an answer of a sentence about like why this is important or, or what you're thinking about that as well. Great, thank you so much for this feedback. Um, I, I, will, I would say good job. The one thing though, and I think this re really ties to multiple teams working on big projects, this is a big project is um, y'all need to get your brand together, you know? Cause so, so some of the look and feel of this one didn't seem to match the look and feel of the other one. And I think that's important that it's cohesive. So if this is coming first, we need to make sure that when we get to the event in, in the showcase and we're showcasing and letting people dive into it even further with the story, that there's not a disconnect that this is not the same. This is not an extension. Um, but other than that, I think you guys did a really good job. And I think that just more of talk between the leads and sharing of assets will help. Yeah, I totally agree. After watching the other team go, how their experience starts with the, the black and white look and feel, that could be how we even start. So yeah, that's really good feedback. Yeah, great, great. Okay, we've got one more team. I hope y'all will stay with the us, <laughs> um, even though we're running over. Um, t uh, Texas Immersive team, you guys ready to go? Yeah, let me just share my screen real quick. Is it frozen? Yeah, I okay, did it unfreeze oh. now? Yeah, it's, it's good. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So my name is Janelle. Um, I'm one of the, my role is kind of like the producer on the Texas Immersive team. Um, so I'm going to be driving this, at least this first part of the presentation along with my peers. Um, initially, so some of the things that we've done with Texas Immersive, um, and the way we've we've kind of marketed it is we've had people do experiences. So like once they got accepted to the program, they've kind of been able to find their own puzzle. They weren't just like, hey, you're accepted. It was like, you have to earn your acceptance. Um, with COVID, it's gotten increasingly more difficult. Um, and we've liked to kind of tra change what we're doing and kind of make that puzzle piece to accept your acceptance and turn it into like a prequel of sorts and make it something that people do before to actually find out about Texas Immersive. So we're using this um, to actually increase uh, awareness of the program itself. Um, alongside myself, we have Kavina, Sarah, Anna, Taylor, Ivy, Jen, Josh, Paige, and Katie, who have all worked on this. 
And what we're going to do is go through a few different things. So mostly being our purpose, you know, we're going to give you a little bit of a teaser of what we ex imagine the experience to kind of feel like um, our persona, our value map, some of the affordances of the technology and the media that we currently have, a little bit of our storyline, a mood board, how we interpret how we um, anticipate the audience interacting with our work. And then we'll go a little bit into the characters that we've created a flow chart, a flow chart and a little bit about our script highlights and what those next steps would look like as you finish the experience. So kind of get to the base of it is why are we doing this? And really, like I mentioned previously, it's to raise the awareness, really expand the reach of and explain what Texas Immersive is by engaging potential applicants through a really engaging experiential marketing piece. Um, it does have a warning, but I'm gonna verbally warn as well. Um, it does have, so if you have like epilepsy or anything like that, um, might wanna look away from the screen for a moment. Yeah, um, and let me know if you can't hear the sound. hope that gives you a little bit of a taste of what we'll be talking to you through um, and the journey that you'd be experiencing moving forward. Okay, so um, this is our audience persona. This is just um, an example of what we might anticipate um, a future explorer to be like. Oh, sorry, I'm Kavina. <laughs> um, uh, for example, they might not be in the School of Advertising. So um, uh, they could be a sophomore in electrical engineering. They love to make music in their free time. They value education, a good college experience. Their goals could be to um, graduate and get a job um, to have happiness in life, their frustrations. They don't quite know what they want to do yet. They don't understand um, um, their, how their many interests and skills can be applied to the real world. And we don't want to give our future explorer a face or name because we don't discriminate here. We um, want to show that um, an explorer can be anyone. Um, this is our digital media value map. Um, we kind of thought about our audience, what their needs, their wants, their pains, their gains, and their motivations are. Um, our motivations being the most important part, um, what their curiosity discover, to discover who they are, what they're really like, um, their agency to participate in something fun, but maybe opportunistic. And then what we created would be um, the purpose of it, their, what the pain relief would be, um, the gains that our audience could gain from it, and then products and services and that would be our marketing kit. And it would be something to provide our uncertain audience with a fun experience to give them an opportunity to explore, practice, and ex um, expand their skill set. Yeah, and so here we really just want to introduce to you why we chose the technologies we chose and the different affordances um, along with each side of them. And so during this experience, we will be focusing um, a lot of the process on a website. Um, and inside the website, we'll embed videos, an AR portal, a 360 video, and broadcast, uh, broadcast audio. Um, and so our team really wanted to dive deep into why we wanted to do each one. Um, and so here, it's a pretty general outline of um, our choices like leading up to the final decision of incorporating these kinds of technologies. Um, one of the most appealing things from all these different technologies was that it was very accessible to the general audience. I um, mean, because our audience are students at UT um, and because UT is not 100% in person yet, we really wanted to make it accessible to everyone who may not be on campus and make it, bring it into their own home. 
And so that's what we tried to do here. I mean, so moving forward, we really wanted to just incorporate different aspects of what an in-person acceptance kit would be like, but online and in your own home. Um, and so um, this really starts with a low barrier of entry. Um, and because it's such a low barrier of entry, it's easy to navigate, it's easy to use, and it's easy to experience. Um, and later on, there is a higher barrier of entry, which includes like a 360 video and AR. And if they don't have the capacity or the technology to view, really experience that, we'll give them an alternate um, experience in which they're still able to um, view it through a video um, on their computer. Um, and so really um, leading into the development of the experience, we wanted to make it authentic and really showcase what it's like to be an explorer at UT. Um, and so that really looks like what um, really made us want to apply to immersive in the first place. And um, so we'll dig deeper into that later on. Uh, I'm Taylor. I'm the writing lead on the project, um, and I'll be walking you through our storyline. So the story begins when a future explorer accidentally falls into the world of the first 48, who are a race of time travelers who brought immersion and technology to our world. So you can think of the first 48 as like the puppeteers of storytelling and tech on Earth. And so when our explorer accidentally falls into their world, they have to be returned back to their time. They don't belong the, immer the immersive people. So across the story, as they come through time, they're seeing the progression of immersion through history, which answers that question, what is immersive, which we hear a lot from future applicants. They're also learning how their skills can help them fit in with the immersive team. So people who don't know coding, you know, don't necessarily feel like they don't have a place with us. Everyone has a place. So all the while, as they're doing this journey through history, experiencing immersive, they're picking up clues that leads to the final puzzle, which is how they exit the portal and return to their time. And once they finish the puzzle, that gives them the application. This is our uh, visual concept for the experience. We wanna keep it feeling kind of mysterious, but also capturing the vibes of each era we walk through, which the two main ones are the invention of broadcast media and the invention of themed entertainment. Um, and we also want to, of course, keep with the taxi branding. And yeah, and so to really engage y'all, we really want to put you through what it might be like to actually go through the experience. And of course, because we haven't begun production, this is just a small snippet of what um, our audience is going to experience. Um, and so now the fun really begins. Um, can I have someone from Giant Spoon um, be our um, student or audience in this example? I can uh, take this one. <laughs> okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, and so um, we just want you to choose your symbol between a talisman, helmet, and a mallet. Which one would you pick? Uh, a mallet. A mallet, okay. Um, and then you wake up and you find yourself stuck in a cave. You discover a toolbox, but you can only take one thing. Which would you choose? A torch, pickaxe, or a map? A torch. A torch. I'm scared of the dark a little. <laughs> Um, and then which one of the three programs interests you the most? A satire talk show, a mystery sci-fi film, or a maker's reality TV series? Uh, TV series. Great. Um, and so after choosing these three, the TV series, the mallet, and the torch, you would most align with the forge. And so to introduce um, the different factions, the forge are the people in society who are the creators, the makers, and really build up what you see in today. Um, and so the two other factions that I want to introduce are the luminaries. And so those are the lawful goods, the leaders of society. Um, and then we have the cerebral, which is the lawful neutral, um, the thinker, the one who's always asking the question. Um, yeah, and so this is really just to outline what each kind of choice goes towards. I mean, so in our actual experience, it'll be a much longer, um, uh, I guess, clicking of like different symbols and things like that. Um, but for the presentation, we decided to click it short um, just so that we can still um, engage you and continue with the rest of what we have. Um, and so um, each choice would basically align with a different faction and that would be what the experiencer um, is aligned with and what could be like in the society of TXI. 
So now I will walk you through the actual experience in the flowchart of how we plan to um, um, go through the experience. So we start with a Canvas pop-up message. If you don't know what Canvas is, it's how all the students go through their classes online, how they turn in all their assignments. And so Canvas has the ability to um, kind of give announcements to all their students. And so we can send them an announcement and be like, hey, check out Texas Immersive, here's a link. And um, we were thinking of highlighting our Bridging Disciplines program, which is um, what um, Texas Immersive is a part of now and um, highlight how anyone can join and how, highlight how it's interdisciplinary. So that way it's not, um, you know, intimidating for people that aren't in the School of Advertising. So it's very inclusive. And then if they click on the link, it will um, send them to the texasimmersive.com, which is um, the website we will plan to host it on. And there will be a pop-up video. Um, this is an introduction video of the three characters or factions that you just saw. And you, at the end of the video, you fall into a portal and it fades into a prompt to watch out for hints. And um, starting here, there will be a narration from the writing team, which we could not include because this flow chart is a little cramped, um, but it will be in the final experience to lead the story and the user forward. And they will go through the first puzzle, which is the quiz that um, you just got a sneak peek of. And there will be a few questions and it's like the Pottermore style personality quiz. And if you can go to the next slide. Uh, and then they will meet their person or their faction, which is the results of the quiz. And they will get a percentage of their faction. And if they get like all three are equal, or if they have two that are kind of equal, they can choose the one that they believe that they fit most with. Um, and then the narration by their faction of the chosen character will start there, and that will be the one that leads them through the story mostly. Um, so then it goes to the next screen on the website, and the main character will explain that, um, so they're in a cave and that there are three forms of communication that will take them the fastest way home. And so that is a broadcast, um, themed entertainment and XR. And they have broadcast and themed entertainment are the two that they can choose from. So there are these like cave drawings, um, etchings on this cave wall. And they're, <laughs> this is a little complicated. So um, they can choose either or to click on and it will lead them to screens later. But for this screen, um, there will be hints on the wall which are these jagged lines and there will be the other factions, the little figures will show them that there are these hints and they will be like, oh, these jagged lines are odd though, aren't they? So that way they will know that there are hints on these walls to pay attention to. Oh, and that was like told on the previous slide where it says um, warn user to begin paying attention to hints. Um, and the different colored callouts um, from hints of different factions of characters to show teamwork and helping each other through TXI um, to really show that we like work together in Texas Immersive. And then so you can either choose to go through broadcast or you can choose to go through themed entertainment. You cannot choose both. And then it will take you to either screen six or screen seven. On screen six, you will go to broadcast, um, which is um, Texas Immersive Showcase screen. And on that screen, um, it will be a, like a retro radio screen and it will be um, Aaron's TEDx speech and sound bites of it. And it, they will be eight second snippets um, and cut through with 1960s um, ads intermittently. And for the visual on the screen, they will be like sound waves and hidden on the screen will be a rune and there will be a call out from the character faction and it will say, whoa, I've never seen radio waves um, move like that to show that, that there is a hint on the screen. 
but if they choose to go to themed entertainment, which is screen seven, there will be two retro posters that they can choose from or choose from to look at. And there will be pop-up screens from those and user gets to pick one and they will be exemplar projects from TXI students and they can look at it, scroll through them, see what's cool about it, and then they can close them out. And on the poster, on one of them, there will be a hidden rune and a call out will say, that's a strange looking um, person on that ride. And then to make sure that the user doesn't get confused, if, or, well, sorry, um, both of the six and seven screens will have the same rune to make sure that whether they choose to go to each one, they will get the same hint. So that way the, um, the user journey will not get messed up. And then after they finish six or seven, they will be, um, they will get to go to eight. So the screen will go down and they will go to eight. And on eight, it will go to Journey Through Time XR TXI Showcase. And then this one is um, showcasing um, AR, which is where we have them. If they aren't able to do AR, they will just see a video of instructions on how AR works. And they will get to still see the hint of a gem, in, which is the hint. Or they will get to actually try the um, QR code and then scan, they will see a portal into the lab of our, our Imagine Lab and they will see the gem in the Imagine Lab and they will get to have a little tour of the Imagine Lab. If they don't, that's okay. They can choose not to. They just get to see the video of the AR. And then to make sure that they return to the um, computer screen because they do get taken away from their computer screen because of the AR portal, we will make sure to in the recording um, because AR can use audio, we will say, hey, it's time to go in um, the voices of the faction characters, um, we'll have them return to their screen. And there's a little call out says, well, did you catch a glimpse of that to make sure they see the hint? Okay, next slide. And then finally, we go to the last um, puzzle, which is the escape patch. And here's the door. Um, they find there's, there's gonna be keys so they can choose the correct key. And um, there's the character call outs again. Um, they say, you're almost there. Use all the clues you have been given to remind them that they have already had the clues um, they need to open this door. So they should remember that there's the purple gem and then the jagged lines from that first cave wall and then the rune that they saw. So they should choose um, the key on the left and then you can do it, you're almost there. And then once they open it, it will go to the last slide. Um, the end, congrats, a pop-up video and then another portal in the video but they're entering back to reality. Congrats, you did it, download TXI. And then we're planning to do maybe a profile picture filter that they can download, a link to application, a link to hiretexasimmersive.com to showcase anything they want to see with information about Texas Immersive. So the experience ends after you complete the puzzle and exit the portal which causes the your character guide to be surprised that you were able to do it since only an explorer should be able to have accomplished that. So naturally this means you are meant to join us in the next cohort. So they explain that to you and you receive the link to the application. Yeah, um, and so I know during this presentation, we really fine line what the experience is gonna be like, especially um, in the puzzles. Um, and we just really appreciate y'all listening to what we have so far um, before we do begin production, which is the next eight weeks. Um, and I think if you guys have any feedback, our team would greatly appreciate it just because we know there's always something to be worked on on a project this big. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. That's great. Awesome.
So the, the only piece of feedback I have is probably the, you can, you can keep the more like comms planning, digital media roadmap, like all that stuff on the end, you sort of like just suck me in with that experience first. Cause it, it's a pretty cool, like ready player one ish sort of vibe to it. Pretty low fi and it's got like, like that sucks you in. And then I know you guys probably have figured out all the other stuff and you can just stick it on at the end. Probably <laughs> like it's, it's the, it's, you can suck me in with that experience first. And then, mm -hmm. and then the, the whole map afterwards, just to show the, the detail you guys have thought through everything, but yeah, this was great. Mm -hmm. I also love the detail. I mean, I, that's like the, the name of the game for me is detail oriented. But I think sometimes, you know, what I what I try to do or get our team to do is think, you know, if this is really feeling like a big explanation, like what's the one sentence, mm -hmm. um, you know, version of this, and then fill that in with the bullet points. But I think, I mean, I I run into this problem a lot with my personally is like, you know, okay, I'm trying, I'm calling Gab, and I'm saying, Gab, we have a new thing coming up, like we have to, you know, filling her in, and I'm like. This is sounding like a little bit of a mouthful. Maybe we need to figure out like how to boil this down into just a sentence. And and that really helps clarify like what are the fun details that you you explore, you figure out once you're going through an experience and like what are the details that need to be upfront and understood to like get a sense of, of what's gonna happen. Um, I also think that, uh, you know, breaking up onto more slides so you can like focus on Here's yeah. step one. Here's the bullet points that happen. Um, visually help keep it more engaging and keep it moving along because you can just see like how much detail and how much thought you guys put into it, which I think is really exciting and reassuring that it's, you know, that things like you've thought through things that our teams have to sit and think through, like, how do they know this is a hint? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, how do they, how can they tell that this is some, something they're supposed to look at closely and having little audio cues or other cues, I think. Um, it's really like shows how far far uh, along you are in the process and how well thought out it is because that's something we run into too. You know, we put something cool on the wall. How are people even supposed to <laughs> look at it or to look mm -hmm. into it? And I think right. that that's uh, it's fantastic that you thought that through. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Go ahead. Oh Sorry. no, go Gabrielle. Go. I might have missed something in your presentation, but did you elaborate on what happens with your persona? I'm going to call it. Is there a sort of experience of like, if you get into um, the school, like what does that persona mean for you? Is there some sort of group down the line so, to expand that experience? Um, it's something definitely that our writers, we didn't show it too much because we knew we only had a certain amount of time, but it's something our mm -hmm. writers have delved into. So that's what the creation of the factions were. We kind of took apart what we thought Texas Immersive was and what really are the different types of roles um, and that's why we use those three different factions and we started with that personality test for them to see like, maybe this might be where you fit and kind of mm -hmm. get an idea. And that's the person that leads them through the process. Yeah. But again, to Kavina's point, when she was explaining it, they're going to show us percentages. So in case somebody is half and half, or if maybe they want to take a different path, they can kind of read about that role and see what other things Texas Immersive offers as well. Very cool. It's great. Yeah, I, I really, I really love the factions because I think that's what's something really unique about Texas Immersive is y'all are so such a diverse group, yeah. right? And that we've really tried creating a lot of different roles that make these type of experiences work, you know, and I, I see that coming through. Um, I completely agree with Sarah that like, um, man, break it, break down the steps a little bit more to the crux. And I, I would love for you guys to do that one more time before you go into production is really, you went through so much detail, but I didn't see it. And I know I've said this 10 million times, show, don't tell, right? Like once you show it and really kind of like, you'll start seeing what needs to be let go and what is like the crux of each action on each kind of part of the story that will move it forward. We'll keep pushing it forward but really good um yeah and for all of you always start with the story you want to hook we've got people here who do not we're kind of in the weeds so i understand why y'all like went into the audience personas and communication and everything but anytime we have guests because we're going to have a ton of guests at the end of the showcase always start with the story 
you know, we want to definitely hook them in and get them excited. And even when you go out and interview with people like this, you want to start with a story, <laughs> you know, you want to hook them into who you are because y'all are each so unique. Um, so really good job. I, I just want to, can we give a big round of applause? Thank you to Mark, Sarah, and Gab for, for staying with us longer than expected and for giving us notes and feedback. You know, it's an, and for sharing your work. I mean, it's been a really memorable and special day for us. I think that we're at mid semester and I, I don't know if you've been following Texas, but like these students uh, did all of this and not only in the middle of the pandemic, but in the middle of uh, Texas snow vid, the polar vortex where half of them lost, lost their homes and lost two weeks of school yeah. while doing all of this. You have so, been through some shit. Yeah. We've totally been through some shit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think no, that- hap Happy to join. This is great. Thank you for the, for the chance to listen to it all. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And, I, and we hope that like your invitation is coming, that you come to our Texas Immersive Showcase at the end. For sure. Um, this, this actually class is the first class to graduate from Texas oh, wow. Immersive. Cool. Yeah. That's great. So, Congrats. So it's exciting. And um, awesome. I don't know if y'all are willing to like share your LinkedIn or if yeah, totally. you're open to letting them follow up with you if they want, but please sure. share your message if so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll send a note out for sure. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, have awesome. a great day and great job class. Uh, have an amazing spring break. This is our last class before spring break. So we all get to take a breather. <laughs> Enjoy it. That's great. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Great job. Thanks so much. Great work. So much. Congratulations on picking immersive. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye bye. Bye. Great job, y'all. <laughs>